Hello, and welcome to the first Satellite Image Deep Learning video podcast. Today, I'm meeting Mikolai, who is a final year PhD student at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow. His work extends to a range of topics, including radar signal analysis, remote sensing, and general computer vision problems, such as generative modeling, image inverse problems, and learning in low data regimes. In the last year, Mikolai has been heavily focused on the task of processing clouds in satellite images, which includes detection, segmentation, and finally, removal of the clouds from affected images. He's the author of two open source solutions related to this problem, which he published this year on his GitHub. One of the removal of clouds with no pre-training and the other for simulating the presence of clouds in clear images. So without further ado, I present to you Mikolai. Mikolai, how are you today? I'm pretty good, how are you? Yes, very good, thank you. Excited to kick off uh, this video series. So would you like to give us a brief introduction to uh, the problem that your, your, your work is solving? Um, absolutely. So I think it's important to realize that whenever we're working with, with these types of solutions for image synthesis or um, image generation, we're usually dealing with two problems actually. So we want to solve the task and generate some images but at the same time, we need to find reliable ways of evaluating that. And we have some general metrics to um, compare image pairs and so on, but it's not just the metrics, it's also the data. And it's quite interesting for uh, the problem of cloud removal because there is probably no possibility of getting like reliable data. I mean, reliable image pairs where we have clear sky and we have the exact same conditions at the exact same, same time um, with some cloud cover. Right? Okay, so, so the, basic, the basic problem is removing clouds from images. That's how you want to solve it. And the challenge is that there's not a good corpus of ground truth data out there. Exactly, exactly. So like this, we want to remove clouds, but at the same time, I, I probably need to work as, just as much on the, on, how, on the methods of evaluating these types of solutions. And, and how are they evaluated currently? So currently there's two, uh, I feel like there's two main paths that are being taken. So we can rely on real data um, and uh, just try to find, when we have a cloudy image, we try to find something that's fairly proximate in time that doesn't have any clouds. Um, but naturally that will involve some other factors changing. So there's no way of actually acquiring um, an image with the same type of lighting, with the same type of conditions. Um, so there could be a whole range of different changing factors, even if we are acquiring images that are quite close in time. Now, the other way is to try to simulate that. So we might start with a clear sky image and we might want to try to simulate the presence of clouds somehow. And if we start in with a clear sky image, we have immediate access to the ground truth. And we know that's probably what should be underneath those clouds. Um, so I feel like there's both advantages and disadvantages of both approaches. And ultimately, I think it's important to look into both and actually try to draw conclusions based on these disadvantages for each uh, and try to stay informed in that way about how the solutions are performing. But recently, I've been working quite a lot on the second approach where we try to simulate the clouds. That's very interesting. So that leads nicely onto the question, how do you simulate clouds? Right. So um, uh, the, the fact that uh, the whole idea of using um, structural noise for simulating clouds uh, dates back to uh, about 10 years ago, or even I think roughly 10 years ago, when the first papers on that have been published. Um, however, um, there's, uh, 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 sorry, uh, I lost my train of thought. We, so there's been a few papers that have used uh, Perlin noise uh, about 10 years ago. And then there were some solutions that tried to maybe cut out real clouds and paste them into clear sky images. So that's another way to simulate that. Um, however, that reliance on real clouds and cutting and pasting them back uh, immediately um, constrains the set of images that we can create. With structural noise, we can generate a very, very wide distribution of uh, different cloud shapes. And we can easily control different parameters to get different uh, looking clouds. So 
um, I feel like even though we're probably missing some important features in, in the, that are present in the clouds that are not present in the structural noise, um, we are still probably on a like we still um, have this advantage of 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 having access to a very very wide and very rich data set if we use uh, uh, these uh, synthetic noise sources. Fantastic. So potentially you can simulate an infinite number of variations on clouds and uh, with different kinds of properties, as you mentioned. Uh, I think that's exactly what you, you've done in this, this piece of work, right? You've created uh, a software that will programmatically create different kinds of clouds and you can integrate that into uh, a training of machine learning models. Is that right? Uh, that is correct. Um, so what, what I've done is, again, nothing particularly uh, groundbreaking where we, uh, when we investigate the literature. However, there's been no open source solution for um for a satellite cloud generator so i've just this it wasn't a whole lot of work it's, it's just a matter of finding a way of um synthesizing a, a, a basically a noise a noise shape uh, uh using one of these established methods and then mixing that with our images and i mean that's uh, that's all there is to it there's some additional tricks to make it uh, look more uh, realistic um and also uh, maybe some uh, ways of uh, parameterizing a cloud. So maybe, as we've already said, maybe there's uh, there are some ways to ensure we get a specific type of cloud uh, in our output. You're being very modest about the, the amount of work I'm sure it has taken. But we'd love to see it now. Have you got an example you can show us? Of course. Uh, so I'll start sharing my screen with the uh, repository and I can give a tool perhaps. Uh, can you see my screen now? Sorry, yes. you're muted. Yeah, yeah okay, yeah, great. Um, right, so I think what we can do, there's a, this is the repository um, and there's some uh, basic information that to be found in a readme. I think what we can do is we can immediately um, just um, run the Collab notebook, which is basically uh, a type of Jupyter notebook that runs on uh, a Google server. And that basically uh, allows us to see um, how uh, these uh, scripts can be used to uh, generate clouds. Uh, so and I'm familiar with Jupyter. Are you using the GPU for the cloud generation process or is this all CPU? Um, so the entire tool is uh, designed to work with Python, so we can potentially backpropagate gradients uh, easily through this operation. Um, so uh, for some of the, I mean, the, the, the processing uh, in the background is not particularly heavyweight. So we should be fine with a CPU, uh, but just the same, we can switch to a GPU server and it might be a tiny bit faster. I've not run any experiments to test the timing because it's fairly fast anyway. And when I incorporated it into, it into uh, training uh, routines in PyTorch, it didn't really cause a huge um, uh, or noticeable uh, delay. Um, yeah, so I guess I can maybe run some of the cells in the notebook. Okay, so this is the, the Hello World notebook for your repository, right? Oh, was that, sorry? This is the Hello World repository, uh, a notebook uh, for your yeah, repository. Yeah, so to speak, it's, uh, yeah, it just imports the, mm -hmm. it imports the package and it uh, runs the basic two commands, which is at cloud or cloud, out cloud, at cloud and shadow uh, with some different parameters to show how uh, we can adjust uh, some of our outputs using these arguments. That's really neat. So you you pass the input image and these other parameters, and you get the image plus the cloud that has been generated. Um, exactly. Uh, so uh, we take an image that is a PyTorch tensor. It can have any number of channels. It doesn't really matter because um, we can add other clouds uh, just in the same way. Uh, to these images um, and all these features will work for any type of channels.
Uh, is, this, any, is this uh -huh. a Sentinel image or is this something higher resolution? Yeah, that's Sentinel 2 uh, from one of the fields in Scotland. Uh, an image I've became very familiar with because I use it for all the all the examples for the past year or two. Um, but yes, that's the uh, so that's the that's the basic uh, command that will generate some clouds and also some shadows. So we don't need to put any argu additional arguments. And what's really neat about the solution is that we get immediate access to a cloud mask and a shadow mask, and that can be really useful for uh segmentation or detection of clouds that we really want or even removal of the clouds that's it's actually a really useful piece of information that's something we cannot get with real data because we will always have um we will always we will always have this type of uncertainty when we use the uh, um the cloud detection or segmentation tools there's always some error associated with them and is it a binary mask or is it more like a probability it's that? It's not binary. So it's actually, it's it's the exact uh, noise shape that has been used to um, generate this cloud. Um, not only that, it's also channel wise, um, which means that we can actually have slightly different presence of the cloud in each channel. That's because we might be acquiring these channels at slightly different time instances. So that's one of the things I've observed uh, when I when I was creating these uh, when I was working on cloud removal methods, is that some of my assumptions uh, were not entirely um, did not really map well to what the real images were. Were and we often see these. It's not that visible in this image, so I'm just gonna go to something where it's more prominent. Like here, we have a kind of a blue edge here. And that's this. That's a result of this misalignment between channels. So this tool will simulate that. It will. Uh, it can be disabled, but by default, it will take a random number between I think minus two and two, and it will shift uh, each channel uh, mask in uh, in a random by a random offset. And that's how we get these um, these types of offsets. Okay, I'm I'm getting ahead of myself here, but. Uh, at the end of this notebook, there is a there is an example how uh, we can use the channel offset to basically indicate by how much we are uh, we want the uh, we want the, the this offset to be. Um, this is the maximum value, so to use a random value in this in this kind of range minus three and three in this case. That's really neat. So I suppose that in a, a training we could apply a range of augmentations and you know make the, the model more robust to these these variations. Exactly, exactly. I mean uh, that that brings me to to the fact that this uh, of, uh, that the, the tool is actually using a few additional features to make this Berlin noise uh, look more realistic. Like most of the literature on the usage of Perlin noise do not really give a lot of attention to how it's actually being used. It's, it's really just mentioned that Perlin noise has been used to generate clouds. And then there's been some more literature on how to make uh, actually cut and pasted clouds look more realistic. So I just applied the same approaches to uh, to Perlin noise. So it's, it's I, I think it's actually just three features. So this offset, uh property then this cloud color that we can control uh so the clouds do not generally in real images appear as pure white there's some uh there's some leakage from the ground and that results in a in a uh, in basically the ambient color of the cloud changing from pure white to something like this so we can again enable or disable that uh, but that's one more feature to make it slightly more realistic. And finally, the blur underneath the cloud. And obviously, it doesn't, it's not very, uh, it's not that apparent when we have very thick clouds. But for uh, thinner clouds, uh, what usually happens is there is uh, the image behind the cloud cover is uh, actually getting more and more blurry uh, depending on how thick the cloud is. Uh, so that's the last feature that is also part of this um, tool. And uh, the first examples that I've shown at the, at the very top of the notebook are using all of these by default. So at the end, we're just looking at uh, all these three features isolated.
Thank you for the introduction, Nicola. This looks like a really uh, compelling piece of work. I can see that being used uh, in training loops to make models more robust to, to real real imagery. And I think congratulations for finding the one cloud for image of Scotland as well. I've never seen it before. <laughs> so this code is on GitHub. Uh, where can people find it? Right. So, um, I mean, if you just try to find this uh, based uh, on the name of Satellite Cloud Generator on GitHub, you should be able to find that. Um, if you want to look at uh, other pieces of my work, you can go to my website at this address, meconvergence.github.io. Um, so there's more stuff there, but I think what's quite relevant uh, to what we were speaking about is the method for removing clouds uh, without any pre-training. So if you want to look at that, um, we've developed a method to kind of remove clouds and maybe also use information from other sources to do that. Um, and what's really cool here is that it can actually adjust to any any type of image. So it's not trying to work with Sentinel-2 or any other type of uh, image. It will work with any number of channels with any kind of data. And uh, we'll try to solve this task in a kind of internal fashion by extracting the information in the image. Um, so uh, yeah, if you if you follow my, my my links, you will be you'll be able to find all these resources. That is fantastic, and your blog looks very interesting. I, I'll be checking on it later. So there's thank no, you so there's much. No blog, for... There's no blog yet. There's just a list of stuff I've done. Oh. But uh, I mean, keep your eyes peeled. Maybe one yeah. day. <laughs> Wow, you have a lot of publications out. That's fantastic. It's, yeah, it's fun work. Yeah. So, how long? How much longer have you got on on your PhD? I've only got about um, five months left, I think. So I'm kind of wrapping up, but there's still yeah. some really interesting uh, work to put out there before I get to writing the thesis. So I'm kind of doing a speed run on a few publications, and I think these will be even more exciting and interesting than uh, these. However. However, the generator will prove to be quite useful for evaluating these methods. So that's something that um, I will find myself pretty useful. Fantastic. Well, I'm very excited to see what you, what you publish in the remaining five months. That's uh, incredible ambition. And uh, I look forward to hearing what's next. So thank you for being a guest today. And I'll post your links in the show notes. But for now, that's goodbye. Brilliant. Thank you for having me.